started, let me open this up with a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for today and uh, grateful for the ministry of the Holy Spirit through which, as you promised, the Spirit uh, can lead us into all truth. And so we study the Bible today um, as we're depending upon the Holy Spirit. And I just pray you'll do a work of illumination today in this uh, flock on campus and online. Um, I pray that you would teach us the things that you would have us to learn. You would convict us in areas where we need to be convicted and if anybody here today in the service or even Sunday school or even watching online doesn't know you personally, I pray that for, for them today can be the day of salvation. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Um, if you guys can find uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And verse 18. Um, As you will recall, we have finished teaching on the doctrine of the rapture. Uh, What is the rapture? When is the rapture? Um, Strengthening the pre-tribulational case. Going through the opposing views. And then we went into one second after the rapture. So I thought the series was going to end there, but it hasn't ended because I gave people a chance to submit questions. And there was such an avalanche of questions that came in. Um, We're going to have to extend the series um, a couple of weeks longer. So we're basically in the part of the series called The Mailbag where we're just sort of trying to um, ask questions that have come in. So I have here 10 10 additional questions. And I'm either sad to say or happy to say I can't figure it out yet, but this is just the tip of the iceberg of the questions. So here we go. Question number one is, will we see the Antichrist? So the question is as follows. Um, If we will see and recognize the Antichrist, does that mean that we will see and watch our loved ones who rejected Christ endure the tribulation? How how will we emotionally respond? (laughs) And then she says, or he says, I don't want to watch that. So this idea of, first of all, are we going to see the Antichrist? Well, there is a generation that will see the Antichrist, and we'll know exactly who he is. Because of what Revelation 13, verses 17 and 18 says. It says there of the Antichrist, and he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Uh, Verse 18 says, Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. So the interpretation that I've given you on this is I believe this relates to something called gematria, It's sort of a strange idea in the West, but when you go back into Greco-Roman history and uh, Hebrew history, it was actually pretty common. So it was the idea that every single letter had a number attached to it. So here's a chart that shows you the different Greek letters and Hebrew letters and the number that went with each one. And I think that's significant because I think when the Antichrist shows up, whoever he is, and he will be a he, and he will be a man, according to what we read here, man, the number of a man, anthropos, 
you'll be able to take his name, whatever it is, and spell it out into Greek, attach the right number to the right letter, add up the digits, and it will yield the total 666. So I don't have any need um, to, to come up with all these allegorical interpretations of Revelation 13, verse 18. People do all kinds of crazy things here. You know, man was created on the sixth day, and we've got three sixes in a row, so it's, you know, man trying to become God. You know, you hear different interpretations like that, and they're mostly allegorical. Uh, allegorical is where you use the language of the text for bringing in some sort of mystical or higher meaning. I think 666 is a lot more literal than most people uh, give due. And it's as simple as taking the Antichrist name, converting it to Greek, attaching the right letter to the right number, adding it up, and it will yield the total 666. So the whole world will have the ability to know who the Antichrist is when he shows up. And that's why receiving the mark of the beast is such a big deal in that time period. uh, Because people are volitionally surrendering to the Antichrist. They're saying no to Jesus and they're saying yes to the Antichrist. So it won't be this kind of thing, you know, where I get emails where people say, you know, my social security card number has a six in it. Have I received the mark of the beast? Um, My employer at work gave me a badge to, electronic badge to get in and out of the building. Is that the mark of the beast? Um, Some people have taken the vaccine and they're worried that they've taken the mark of the beast. And you see, those things might be stage setting at best for the mark of the beast, but they're not the mark of the beast because everybody on the earth when this takes place will know exactly who the Antichrist is. It won't be an accidental thing or a whoops, I wish I hadn't have done that kind of thing. And they will be volitionally surrendering to him and saying no to Jesus. And so the, this question is asking, um, are we going to see people come under this mark of the beast? And the answer to that is we will not see it this side of the rapture. Why? Because as we have tried to explain, as long as the church is on the earth, the Antichrist cannot come forward. And we gave a lot of teaching in this series on the restrainer. Paul says, and you know what restrains him. Him is the man of lawlessness. So that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And the one who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And to make a long story short, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit through the church. So as long as the church is present, because the Holy Spirit is in us forever, amen, the man of sin or the Antichrist can't come forward. So these prophecies about Revelation 13, verse 18, they relate to the generation subsequent to the rapture. So at very best, you will see the Antichrist from heaven, And you will see loved ones take the mark of the beast from heaven. I'm not sure what kind of view God is going to give us of everything once we're in heaven. And is it going to be painful to watch? Um, I'm sure it will be, but you'll be in a resurrected body. So a lot of our sinful impulses will be gone. And you'll be able to see things as God sees them. So are we going to see all of this? The bottom line is not this side of the rapture, but perhaps on the other side of the rapture from heaven. So I hope that helps with that particular question. Um, The second question that comes in is the date for the rapture. And the question is, do you believe the rapture is soon? There are many preaching this month, next month, Then they say Mother's Day. I don't know why they threw Mother's Day in here. 
Um, then they say it can only be on the third Tuesday after a second Tuesday, etc. What do you say? And the first part of the question, they say, do you believe that the rapture is soon? And my answer to that is yes. The reason I think it's soon is because we have a seven-year tribulation period that has to come into existence and the stage has to be set for that seven-year tribulation period. So we've used this analogy before. It's a lot like a chessboard. You can't just have a chess game until the stage is set or the game board is set. Someone has to take the game board out of the box, set it up on the table. You have to arrange the pieces in their proper order. You've got to have the players take their respective seats. On opposite sides of the table, that means you have to have a table and a chair, or two chairs at least, and a game board, and game pieces, and then the game pieces have to be assembled right, and as all of that sort of introductory stuff is happening, um, you say, well, a chess game is about to start. That is how to look at our world as the seven-year tribulation period is approaching. We are not in the tribulation period, but before a person, particularly someone my height, enters a building or a room, you see the shadow before the person. You know, the shadow is not the reality, the person is the reality, but the shadow precedes the reality. So there's a lot of things going on in our world concerning, you know, the movement into the new world order, um, Bill Gates and uh, the World Economic Forum and the regathering of the Jews in unbelief to their homeland and on and on we could go with these signs. But those signs are not the microchip technology is another potential sign. They're not the tribulation, but they're the shadows of it. And you'll notice here from our chart that the rapture, and we've spent 62 lessons trying to argue this case, the rapture precedes the tribulation. So if the signs and the shadow of the tribulation is approaching and the rapture precedes the tribulation period, then the rapture must be coming even faster. Um, I can't obviously give you a date on it because the Bible doesn't give you a date on it, but the question is asked, do you think it's coming soon? Well, my goodness, the world is almost like in warp speed getting ready for the tribulation. And if that's coming that fast, then the rapture of the church must be coming even faster. I, I do believe this, that the Holy Spirit has desired every generation to believe that they are the ones that will be raptured. Because it has a natural stimulus on choices that we make. We have a greater incentive to live for holy and eternal things if you know that the Lord can come back at any moment, you know, via the rapture. It's just our generation has far more signs than any generation that's ever come before us. And if the Lord tarries and we're not the generation, then the next generation will have even more signs. And I think that's the right way to understand some of these things. But beyond that, obviously, I'm not in a position to give a date for the rapture. Because the rapture is signless. You see, the tribulation period is not signless. Um, Jesus cannot touch down his feet on planet Earth until the seven years of tribulation elapse. So there are many, many signs for his second advent, but there are no signs for the rapture, which precedes these events and can happen in the next split second. For example, if you look over at the book of James just for a minute, chapter 5, one of our classic verses on eminency. It says, you too be patient, strengthening your hearts. See how practical this doctrine is? It relates to strength, patience. For the coming of the Lord is near. Some versions say he's right at the door. 
In fact, verse 9 does say that. He's right at the door. And then it says, do not complain, brethren, against one another. See how practical the doctrine is? It relates right down to whether we're going to be complaining people or not. So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. So it's like taking a velvet plastic ball. And you remember you could take those and throw them up on the ceiling and they would stick there. And, um, you know, the interesting thing about once they're stuck up on the ceiling is you don't know when they're going to fall back down. So you always have to keep an eye on them. That's sort of how the rapture is. You always want to be waiting because the Bible says it could happen in the next split second. And so I I like to use this analogy. I think this is an analogy used by the late John Walvoord related to Christmas. What are we in now? October. Um, Once we hit October 31st and move into November 1st, I can guarantee you the first day of the month, they're going to start putting their Christmas, everybody's going to put Christmas stuff up in the department store. Uh, You're going to see Santa Claus, you're going to see Christmas lights, you're going to see Christmas trees, you're going to see snow, you know, fake, I don't know what kind of snow we're going to have in Houston, but fake snow. And all of a sudden, and then you're going to start hearing Christmas songs on the radio. And you say to yourself, well, these are the signs of Christmas, so Thanksgiving must be coming. Because Thanksgiving occurs earlier on the calendar than Christmas. So we know that Christmas is coming because we see the signs. But wait a minute, Thanksgiving comes even faster. And so Thanksgiving is imminent. That's sort of the way to understand, you know, the doctrine of the rapture. Beyond that, I would not waste your time getting into a bunch of date setting things. You know, Mother's Day... Uh, the third Tuesday after a second Tuesday, um, this month, next month, all of that stuff is a complete and total waste of time because of the nature of the church. The rapture concerns the church. The church is not Israel, and Israel is not the church. It is Israel that goes through the tribulation period but the church is removed before the tribulation period. And if you're, look, if you're trying to make it fit a calendar, you, you're not understanding the mystery nature of the church. God gave the church to be different than Israel, and one of the key differences is Israel has a calendar. Passover, Leviticus 23, Passover... Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Trumpets, Atonement, Booths. We've got, um, let's see, four, is it? Um, spring Feasts, or maybe, yeah, there's the Spring Feasts, and then later there's the Fall Feasts. These happen on a specific calendar. The church has nothing like this. I know at Sugarland Bible Church, we have a calendar and we put all our events on it, okay? But that's about as close to a calendar as you're going to get in the church because the church by nature is dateless. Um, It doesn't have a specific calendar. It doesn't have months. Israel had specific months. You can see them here. So when people get into this sort of, you know, is it going to happen on Mother's Day? Is it going to happen on the second or third Tuesday? And this whole mindset, they're not understanding that the church, by definition, has no calendar. Um, In fact, you can study the doctrine of the church. We've studied it here, the doctrine of ecclesiology. And you can go from Acts 2 all the way through the end of Revelation 3. And you will, which is the part of the Bible that governs or deals with the church, you're not going to see any date or any calendar for anything. But you do see that for Israel. Um, Concerning Israel, the spring feasts, Jesus fulfilled specific things for Israel in his first coming during spring feasts. 
I mean, when Passover happened, something took place. When unleavened bread happened, something took place. In the final elements of Christ's life, first fruit, something took place. Pentecost, something took place. And then there's a gap between the end of the spring feasts and the beginning of the fall feasts. Now, who do you think goes in that gap? That's we, the church, which has no calendar. But one of these days, the church is going to be removed via the rapture at a time known only to God. And Jesus will begin his unfinished work with Israel and the remaining uh, fall feasts, trumpets, atonement, and booths he will fulfill on a specific calendar date for Israel. So Israel has all kinds of dates and all kinds of calendars or a calendar and months. The church has nothing of the sort. You study the biblical material dealing with the church and there's no such thing as, as a calendar like Israel had. So you have to understand that when people get into these date setting schemes, they're meshing God's program with the church and God's program with Israel together. And they're not seeing the Israel church distinction. Once you start seeing the Israel church distinction, it saves you from all of this crazy speculation that's out there. People setting dates for the rapture, which concerns the church and not Israel. So when is the rapture going to happen? When God wants it to happen. And it could happen in the next split second. Other than that, don't be preoccupied with all of these other things, Mother's Day, Third Tuesday, etc. All right, hope that helps. Question number three relates to believers protected during the tribulation. And this question says, I understand that we are not appointed unto wrath as Christ's children. That said, will the tribulation saints after the rapture, of course, be divinely protected like the Israelites were protected in Egypt during the Passover from God's wrath. Now, this is um, a big argument for post-trib people that believe the church is going through the tribulation. And you say, well, what do you do with all of the prophecies that say we're not appointed unto wrath? They say, well, God is going to supernaturally protect believers during the tribulation. In fact, my first exposure to post-tribulationalism was by watching the 700 Club and Pat Robertson. Uh, Some of the things he does I appreciate, others not so much. But he used to have this chalkboard, and he would draw out end times charts. And you watch him long enough and you discover that he is a post-tribulationalist. And I remember as a new Christian watching him draw on the chalkboard and teaching that one of the things he said is, well, yeah, we're not appointed unto wrath, but once we go into the tribulation, we're going to be somehow supernaturally protected. Just like folks in Egypt were protected. Israel was protected from certain um, judgments. You can see Israel being protected from certain judgments in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 22. Exodus chapter 8 verse 24. Exodus chapter 9 verse 4 and verse 6. Exodus chapter 11 verses 4 through 7. And so Pat Robertson was saying, well, the church is going to be supernaturally protected from God's judgments the exact same way. And with all misinformation out there, there's always a little bit of truth to it. We certainly are, or the people in the tribulation period that are believers, are shielded from certain judgments. You see that in Revelation 9, verse 4, concerning trumpet number 5, I think it is. And Revelation 16, verse 2, concerning bull judgment number 1. You'll see that those judgments, some of them don't hit all of the believers. And so Pat Robertson was trying to make the case that that's how it's going to be through the whole tribulation. And that's how he escaped this tension of we're not appointed under wrath, yet we're going into the tribulation. The truth of the matter, though, is people in the tribulation period that become believers may be protected 
from some judgments, but certainly not all of them, because most of them are going to be martyred. And there, under number two, I've got all of the examples of God's people being killed. In the tribulation, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, that's the martyrs under the altar crying out to God for vengeance. Revelation 7, 13, and 14. Uh, more examples of martyrdom. Revelation 13, verse 10, verse 15. Look, look, for example, at Revelation 17, verse 6, and tell me if you think believers in the tribulation period are going to escape God's wrath. It says, and I saw the woman drunk, uh, the harlot, the end time harlot, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of witnesses, blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Well, gee, Pat, you didn't put that on your chalkboard, that, that verse. You left that one out. Revelation 18, verse 24 and in her, that's Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets, of the saints, and all who have been slain on the earth. Um, Revelation 20, verse 4, mentions martyrs. Now people say, well, that's just martyr, martyrdom. God isn't causing that. Are you kidding me? Who, who's the one that opened the seven-sealed scroll unleashing the Antichrist? It was Jesus Christ himself. So with all of that being said, we are not appointed unto wrath, meaning we can't be in any part of the tribulation period, even though some of the tribulation period involves some believers during that time period being spared from certain judgments. It certainly isn't the norm. And so that's where the kind of the post-tribulationalism argument collapses. By the way, that's why the rapture is always called a comfort Paul says, comfort one, one another with these words when he describes the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. Jesus, when he unfolds the rapture for the very first time, John 14, verse 1, says, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, let me just ask you a common sense question. If I'm up here telling you that you're going to go into the tribulation period, and you're likely going to have your head cut off by the Antichrist, do you receive a lot of comfort from that? I sure don't. Titus 2 verse 13 calls the rapture the blessed, blessed hope. So I hope that um, helps with that question. Um, here is number four. This is a fun one because it says, we are a couple from Germany. So this ministry has a far bigger impact than what we see here in the building. In fact, there's a couple here today that's visiting all the way from Alabama. That's pretty cool, huh? So they say, we are a couple from Germany and very much enjoyed each lesson of your study on the rapture. But they're bothered by something. It says, does the Bible teach that according to Revelation 19, verse 4, as, as we raptured believers must return to the earth, leaving heaven again? The Bible says that we are heaven's citizens and God's household members. Wouldn't we not have tasks in heaven? Why do we return with Jesus to the earth and it could be that this is only concerned, could it, could it be that his return to the earth only concerns the angels? Not us, in other words. Matthew 25, verse 31. This verse, to our understanding, is speaking about the heavenly host returning with Jesus. For us, it's somehow sad to understand that after seven years in glory in heaven, we must return to a desolate earth. And then they end with many blessings from Germany. Then they give me some German expressions that I can't pronounce. And too bad Hans isn't here to help me with that stuff. So the question is, okay, the church is raptured to heaven before the tribulation period. We're with the Lord for seven years, which is going to be great. But then we've got to come back down again? 
I mean, what a bummer. Uh, why can't we just stay up in heaven? So the answer to that question is understanding our full destiny in Christ Jesus. Yes, we are a heavenly people. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So you don't need to pray anymore for God to bless you. Oh, Lord, bless me. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says he's already done that. And by the way, on the subject of giving, we don't give to be blessed. We give because we're already blessed. See, if you go to God groveling, saying, Lord, give me another blessing, he's basically looking at your ledger and saying, you're already maxed out. There's no room for a further blessing. It's just that they are heavenly blessings, spiritual blessings. Um, and so because we're a heavenly people, our focus is always to be heaven, uh, looking towards heaven. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. Boy, and I need to read that, particularly in the month of June when Supreme Court decisions start getting handed down in the United States, many of them are wicked and godless. And I get very discouraged about it. And then you flip open to Colossians 3, verse 2, where I really should be focused on heaven anyway. I mean, it's okay to be aware of world events, but the truth of the matter is um, our focus should always be heavenward, not on the earth, because we're God's heavenly people. And it is true, we have a heavenly destiny. Jesus said in John 14, verse 2, in my Father's house, now where is the Father's house? It's in heaven. Are many dwelling places, if it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus promised us in the upper room that one of these days he's coming back for his disciples and he's going to take them to heaven. Over in Philippians 3 verse 20, it says our citizenship is in heaven. So it is true that we are God's heavenly people and we have a heavenly destiny. However, that's just part of the picture. That's about, I don't know, an important part of the picture. That's an important part of the, it's an important piece of the jigsaw puzzle, but it's not the complete tapestry. It's not the complete mosaic. Because the Bible also teaches you, as God's church, that you don't just have a heavenly destiny, but you have a earthly destiny. You say, well, where is that in the Bible? It's in Revelation 5. Verse 10, Revelation 1, verse 6 says he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. Did you know that, by the way, that you're a priest? So you don't have to go to someone to confess your sins to get to God because you already have a direct hotline to heaven. The red phone is on your desk. Use that phone. Don't, don't go down the street and put a couple of quarters in and call collect on another line. That's unnecessary. He has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Mm, interesting. Then in Revelation 5 verse 10 it says, You have made them to be, a king, to be a kingdom and priests to our God. That's us, the church. And now watch this. They will, future tense, hasn't happened yet. They will reign upon the what? The earth. Ah, so I have a heavenly destiny as a Christian. Seven years with the Lord in heaven, but I have an earthly destiny. The earthly destiny is to rule and reign 
under Christ's delegated authority during the millennial kingdom. And right now, everything that's happening in your life and in my life is preparing you for that authority. Just like everything that happened in Joseph's life from age 17 to age 30 prepared him for the time would come where he would be elevated second in command over all of Egypt. Everything that's happening in your life is preparing you to be being second in command over the earth that's going to be governed by Jesus himself. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13 says, it is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure with him, we will reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Watch the context very carefully there. It's not talking about loss of salvation. What it's talking about is denying a Christian the maximum authority that Christ wants to give them in the earthly kingdom. Verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. So I have a choice as a Christian. I could lapse back into fear. And if I do that and don't boldly fulfill my calling, then I'm still going to heaven and I'm still going to participate in the earthly kingdom, but not to the degree of authority that I could have wielded. That's why in Luke 19, it talks about some inheriting 10 cities. Uh, I think it goes on, it says some inheriting five cities. I mean, why the difference? It relates to whether we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in this life in the preparation process. Because nobody likes the pain of preparation. We all like the product, but we don't like the process. <laughs> and anybody that excels in anything in life, I don't care what it is, athletics, brain surgery, whatever, went through much, much preparation to reach that level. And we don't see the preparation, we just see the product. We love the product, but we don't like the preparation. The truth of the matter is the product is coming. The authority that we will wield, the degree to which we individually wield that authority is contingent upon whether we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit currently to prepare us for that role. Joseph could not become Joseph at age 30 until he went through what he went through from age 17 to age 29. And so this is all part of our ultimate destiny. And we know that Jesus is coming back to this earth. Did you know that? The rapture, he doesn't come to the earth. We are caught up. But subsequent to the seven years of tribulation, he comes right back to planet earth. His feet touch the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, verse 4. He will sit on David's throne with his angels accompanying him. Matthew 25, verse 31. In fact, the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, tells you he's coming back to the earth. Job 19, verse 25. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will take his stand on the earth. Exactly what Revelation 5, verse 10 says. So the interesting thing about getting married, because right now we're engaged. The interesting thing about getting married is, is the, the husband, and they're no longer bride and groom. They're husband and wife, and they're inseparable. So where the husband goes, the wife goes. Where the wife goes, the husband goes. That's why it's not good etiquette when you have a party to invite one without the other sort of thing. So... And, of course, there might be some exceptions there. But anyway, the fact of the matter is Jesus is coming back to the earth. So if you're married to him, where are you going? You're coming back to the earth, too, to fulfill your earthly destiny. 
That's why he says in John 14, verse 3, concerning the rapture, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Well, why is that? Well, you're married now. What's the term? You're hitched. So if Jesus is in heaven for seven years, that's where you're going to be. If Jesus at the end of seven years is coming back to the earth, you're coming back with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17 says, Concerning the rapture, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So if it can be documented biblically that Jesus is coming back to the earth at the end of the seven year tribulation period, and it can, then you're going to be coming back with him. So you have an heavenly destiny in Christ as a member of his church and an earthly destiny. This is why our relationship to the Lord is analogized to the 10 steps of a marriage, a Jewish marriage. If you understand those 10 steps, you'll understand your future. Step one, the groom initiates, the covenant is established upon paying for the bride That's, of course, the death of Jesus for us 2,000 years ago. Then the bride is set apart exclusively for the groom. That's the process that we're in now, where there's a time of separation. Number three, the bridal chamber is prepared. The groom separates from the bride and returns to his father's house to prepare the bridal chamber. That's John 14, verse 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Behold, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. So we're right there in step three. Step four is the betrothal period during the time of separation, which is the loyalty test. So how do we demonstrate our loyalty to Christ today, living in Satan's world as the bride with the groom in heaven? Two ways, orthodoxy correct belief, orthopraxy, correct practice. Then number five, the groom returns at an unknown time preceded by a shout with escorts to retrieve the bride. What event do you think that would be? That's the rapture. That's John 14, verse three. Then the bride and the groom are hidden in the father's house for seven days. Not six days, not eight days, seven days. What do you think that might refer to? Us in heaven with Jesus for seven years. Number seven, the bride is cleansed. She goes through a ritual cleansing ceremony, probably a reference to the Bema Seat judgment, which we experience in heaven not long after we're raptured where we are either given or not given rewards. It's not a judgment to determine salvation. Number eight, there's a wedding ceremony, meeting with the father's assembled guests and a private wedding ceremony in heaven. So now we're no longer the bride, we are the wife of the lamb. Then number nine, the bride and the groom consummate the marriage. And then number 10, is the marriage feast, which is public, a public presentation where the bride is unveiled and there's a marriage feast. What would that refer to us returning with Jesus, ruling and reigning alongside his delegated authority for a thousand years? And man, you better be ready to pig out. I guess I could put it that way. Because there's going to be a feast like you've never seen before. So you'll notice that in these 10 steps, there's something that goes on in the Father's house and something that goes on subsequent to the Father's house in public. In the same way, we have a destiny for seven years in the Father's house, but we have also a destiny upon the earth. So people that say, I just want to stay in heaven and I don't want to come back don't understand the full picture. They understand a piece here or there, but no one's ever explained to them the whole enchilada or the whole shawarma would be a better analogy because this is Jewish. 
And by the way, let me head something off here. Do you see verse 2 where it says, In my Father's house are many dwelling places? A lot of English translations say mansions. And that relates to Tyndale following the Latin Vulgate and putting mansions, because it sounded an awful lot like the Latin word, into the Tyndale um, English version, the King James, which is a very good translation, by the way, but it's not perfect. The King James followed Tyndale. And so if you're a King James reader, what it'll say in your version most likely is, in my father's house are many mansions. That is not what the Greek says. The Greek says mone, which is a temporary watch house or an inn. When you check into an inn, you're not there forever. You're there temporarily. So when you throw in mansions into this, it makes it sound like, gosh, you know, I've got my sauna, I've got my jacuzzi, I've got my tennis court, I've got my fine dining, I've got my 10 million cable stations to cycle through. I mean, I've got everything I need. I'm in a mansion. Why do I have to come back to the earth? And that's part of the confusion. It deliberately does not say mansions in the Greek. It wants you to understand that what you have in heaven, now don't get me wrong, it's not going to be like the ghetto or something. You'll be very happy. But you'll look around and you'll sort of be able to tell that this is kind of like a hotel. I'm not here forever. Why am I not up here forever? Because I have a destiny to fulfill on the earth. So the last time I taught on this, I was at a church and I was trying to explain all this. And out, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the music leader start leafing through all the songs, you know. And he was going to do a closing song. And after it was all said and done, I said, what were you so busy, you know, leafing through your material for? He says, man, I had to change all my songs at the last minute because I had all these songs we were going to sing about mansions in the sky and... <laughs> And you just ruin the whole thing. So I hope that helps a little bit with that particular question. Oh, let me show you something really neat. Go to the book of Galatians, if you could. Chapter 4, verse 26. Um, I don't want to be dogmatic on this. This is not something to start a new church over, necessarily. But it talks about the heavenly city... The new Jerusalem, which does not descend until this world at the end of the millennial kingdom is dissolved by fire and replaced with a new heavens and new earth. What you discover in Galatians 4 verse 26 is that eternal city, the new Jerusalem, currently exists. So I used to think it came into existence once we got to the far right of the screen, the eternal state. But that's not true because it says in Galatians 4.26, but the Jerusalem above is, present tense verb, is free. She is, present tense, our mother. So there's a line of thought, and I think Dr. Pentecost held to this, that the New Jerusalem currently exists. It's just not fit to come to this this earth because this earth has been contaminated by sin. It will come one day to a new heavens and new earth, but currently it's suspended in space above the earth, which means during the thousand-year kingdom while we are fulfilling our earthly destiny, that new Jerusalem will be in place in heaven. And there's a line of thought indicating that we're going to be able to go back and forth between the two. Why is that? Because we'll be in a resurrected body as the church, um, which is not bound by the normal laws that govern our current body. Jesus, in his resurrected state, John 20, 
walked right through a wall. So therefore, since our resurrected body is like his resurrected body, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, other passages teach it, we're going to be in a body which is still you. You're still recognizable, but it's not bound by the normal properties and laws that we're bound by today, which could include the law of gravity. So that may give evidence as to how we, as God's resurrected church during the thousand-year kingdom, will be ruling and reigning on the earth, but every once in a while you'll be able to kind of airlift and kind of see what's going on in the New Jerusalem. And then the Lord says, okay, I need you to come back down because there's a few more cities I want you to rule over. So you come back down. Um, is that in the Bible? It's not as clear as I'd like it to be, but it's a strong inference. So keep in mind that as a member of Christ's church, you have a heavenly destiny uh, and an earthly destiny. Question number five deals with demons during the millennium. This really isn't a rapture question, but it says, my working assumption has always been that demons will be with Satan in the abyss, Revelation 20, verses two and three. We know that when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom, Satan will be thrown into a place called the abyss. You see that in Revelation 20, verses 2 and 3. So Satan's defeat is in seven stages. This would be stage number six, when he is incarcerated during the millennial kingdom as the earth is being repopulated by the believing survivors of the tribulation period. So, so Satan is bound during that time, but there's nothing said about the demons being bound. So the question is, my, my, the question is, while Satan will be in the bottomless pit in Greek called the abyss during the millennium, where will the demons be? And this is actually a question that Bill Salas um, wrote me via email. And you got to be careful with emails because he took my response and he put it in his book. So I didn't know he was going to do that, but he he treated me favorably, so I guess I'm not going to complain. But here was my answer to his question. I mean, are demons going to be present in the millennium? I wrote, my working assumption has always been that demons will be with Satan in the abyss, since according to passages like Matthew 25, verse 41, and Revelation 12, verse 7, the demons or the fallen angels will be under Satan's authority. That's why fallen angels are called Satan and his angels. So the angels that fell with Satan initially are under his authority, are under his control. Satan and his angels, Matthew 25, verse 41, Satan and his angels, Revelation 12, verse 7. And so what I wrote here is, so wherever Satan is, they're, 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 the demons will be also. So I'm assuming that the demons will also be put into the abyss with Satan during the thousand-year kingdom. So the thousand-year kingdom will be a time period with no satanic influence. No demonic influence at all. So I guess things are going to work out well, right? No. <laughs> There's a giant rebellion at the end. It's described in Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9. By the way, don't panic. You won't be in the rebellion because you'll be in a resurrected state. But the descendants of the survivors of the tribulation period who were believers whose forebears repopulated the earth will still have a sin nature. And they will be living in Garden of Eden conditions for a thousand years. And yet what happens at the end of that thousand year time period? There's a rebellion as, as, as much as there's sand on the seashore. 
Satan is let out just to reveal what's happening in the hearts of people. You say, well, why would God allow such a catastrophe to happen? Because history is pedagogical. God allows eras or epics of history to transpire to teach humanity lessons that they couldn't learn any other way. And one of the great lessons the human race needs to learn under God's tutelage is that we sin not because of our environment. We sin because of our what? Our nature. Because we have in Adam a nature that hates God. Now, God could either tell us that, which he does in many places, or he could show us it. And he gives humanity a thousand years of perfection with no satanic influence whatsoever, no demonic influence whatsoever. So you can't blame sin on poverty. You can't blame it on lack of education. You can't blame it on social injustice. You can't blame it on the fact that the environment's not right, the wealth isn't redistributed, whatever people are blaming everything on today, because Jesus is running the world and everything's perfect. You blame it on a nature that hates God. And that's why the business of God is to give us a new what? Nature. That's why when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, He says, I tell you the truth, you can't see or enter the kingdom unless you are born again, born from above. So the whole emphasis of Christianity is not fixing up the devil's world. A lot of churches are like that today. You listen to them preach and teach, and it's all about let's get out there and make this world a better place. That is not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is about an internal transformation that only God can do and if a person has never received that internal transformation it doesn't matter what environment they come from how bad it is or how great it is they're going to be a rotten sinner at the end of the day and Jesus gives us a thousand years and says see I told you which means Satan can't have influence during that time period nor can the demons So that's another reason why I think that when Satan is put in the abyss, not only does Satan go in there, but the demons do as well. Oh, very fast. Um, Number six, how do we respond to those who say that the rapture was a doctrine introduced by Darby in the 1800s? Anybody heard this? And that apparently he got it from a lady who was having some kind of phony visions, Margaret MacDonald. Darby... In the 1800s, got it from a crackpot so-called prophetess who was a teenager named Margaret MacDonald. So that's where the rapture came from. Common propaganda. What do you do to respond to it? You listen to lesson four in this series where we covered that. And lessons 37 through 38. And you, you understand that that argumentation is filled with logical fallacies. Number one, the recency fallacy. If something is recent, it must be wrong. Number two, the odd populum fallacy. If the majority thinks something is right, it must be right. Those are all logical fallacies. By the way, they said the same thing about Luther. Luther in the Protestant Reformation, 16th century, was talking about faith alone through Christ alone. And the Roman Catholic Church attacked him and said, that's a new doctrine. And Luther said, I don't care. It's in the Bible. So the rapture doctrine is in the Bible. It has nothing to do with Darby and his allegedly stealing it from a 17-year-old or a teenager named Margaret uh, MacDonald. Beyond that, I have a book called Ever Reforming where I explain to you why the rapture doctrine was lost in the Middle Ages. It's called the Dark Ages. lasted for over a thousand years where people couldn't even read. 
you expect people to be literate when they can't even read? That's why you don't find sound rapture doctrine pre-Protestant Reformation. Beyond that, um, prophecy is designed by God to become more understandable as the events get closer. Daniel 12, verse 4, Daniel 12, verse 9. Beyond that, there are some people all the way back in the 4th century that did believe in a pre-trib rapture. One of them I've shown you is this man, Pseudo-Ephraim. So these are all, when people go to this late date argument, they're, they're committing all kinds of logical fallacies. And when they try to link Darby to this Margaret MacDonald, this prophetess, that Darby supposedly stole the rapture from her, they're committing another fallacy called the genetic fallacy, which is the idea that you can discredit an idea based on its source. You don't discredit ideas based on where they came from. You discredit them only if they contradict the scripture. Genetic fallacy. And beyond that, and I've looked very carefully at Margaret MacDonald's alleged vision. Dave McPherson, a vitriolic anti-pre-tribulational rapturist, has it printed in his book. So I went back and I read the whole vision and there's nothing in it that looks anything like the pre-trib rapture. If anything, she was kind of like a partial rapturist and it looked like she was like mid-trib or post-trib or something like this. So people that circulate this idea that Darby stole it from McDonald have actually never read what the vision was stated by Margaret McDonald. Um, the key scholar to look at, if you want to find specific answers to this idea that Darby stole the pre-trib rapture doctrine from McDonald, is the work of Dr. Paul Wilkinson. His book, For Zion's Sake, which was his doctoral dissertation in historical theology, I mean, he just disproves the whole thing from stem to stern. I mean, A, Margaret MacDonald was a charismatic, Darby was not. So why would Darby listen to a Pentecostal? B, Margaret MacDonald's prophecy doesn't even sound like pre-trib. C, they've got the dates all wrong. You know, it's highly likely that Darby had limited, if any, encounter with Margaret MacDonald. But the thing people are doing today is they're trying to discredit, and they're all over the internet doing this, they're trying to discredit the rapture by linking it to Margaret MacDonald. It's a lot like what they're doing with America's founding fathers. They don't like the limited government model espoused by America's founding fathers, so let's demonize the founding fathers, right? The 1619 Project. I mean, don't you know they owned slaves and they were terrible people and George Washington used to grab his slaves and yank their teeth out and on and on and on they go. And they think that if they can tear down America's founding fathers, they can tear down the freedom and patriotism that we have in the United States. That's exactly what they're doing with John Nelson Darby. And it's just, it's just a smear. It's one lie after another. Um, the problem is they're all over the internet saying it, and if you say something long enough, people will eventually what? Believe it. So what I'm saying is don't believe it. Get Paul Wilkinson's book for Zion's sake, and you can see that Darby had nothing to do with Margaret MacDonald. And even if he did, who cares? The doctrine is in the Bible. You see how they've diverted attention away from the Bible to Darby and McDonald? They get us so busy defending the difference between Darby and McDonald that no, no, we're not looking at the Bible anymore. The doctrine's in the Bible. That's what Luther said in the Protestant Reformation. I don't care if the popes or the priests agree with me. Sola Scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, sola Christos, sola Deo Gloria is in the Bible. That's why Luther said that he was married 
to Galatians. He called Galatians his wife. Mein Frau is how Luther referred to Galatians. I'm telling you, the biggest mistake the Roman Catholic Church ever made is they didn't know what to do with Luther because in the monastery, he was a total pain in the backside. He kept showing up and wanting to confess every single sin he'd ever committed every single day, and they just got sick of him. So they said, what can we do with this guy? I know what we'll do. We'll make him a Greek teacher. So he started teaching Greek to the first year students in the Roman Catholic monastery. And he started to see that everything the Roman Catholic Church taught wasn't in the Bible. And he st- that's what started the Protestant Reformation. And Luther had hurled at him all of the arguments about this is a late doctrine. The priests and the popes don't believe in this. And Luther said, I don't care. So by way of comparison, whatever they want to say about McDonald and Darby and how late it came up, I don't care because I can see it in the Bible. Well, I'm starting to preach a sermon here. All right. So let's pray. Father, we're grateful for Sunday school. Help us to think correctly about the rapture in these last days. Be with us in the main service. Also, in the communion service and the fellowship lunch that follows, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Happy mini intermission.